All right, so our speaker. What about the hug? Let's let the show. <laughs> so normally, normally Siegel introduces these things, but he's sort of on the run. But a drug deal gone bad, apparently. <laughs> last week, he was in Switzerland. So. But anyway, our, our speaker uh, is going to talk to us today about Mbari, which is uh, an open source alternative to Cloud Air Manager. So I, it's something I haven't heard about yet, and I'm really interested in it. Take it away. <coughs> Uh, so yes, today I'm going to talk a little bit about Apache Ambari. Uh, my name is Jeff Spozzetti. I actually work at Wordworks and uh, I work on the product. Is it, is it Ambari. going Zephyr? Is that okay? A little bit A little bit louder. Put it in your nose. Yeah. Is, that, is that better? Yep. Yeah, a little bit better. All right. <laughs> the worst word. <laughs> I'm sorry, dude. Is that, is that better? Yeah. yeah. All right. So uh, I'm going to talk about Apache Ambari. I'm actually from Hortonworks, and I'm on the Ambari product team. I'm actually an Ambari committer as well. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what it is, what we're doing with it, uh, how it works under the hood, some of the technologies that are there, and some of the future things we're doing with the overall platform for it. So uh, to give you an idea, try this one more time. Slide one goes bad. A little better. All right, great. So we'll give an overview of the product and talk about the community. Then we'll talk about the architecture of it. We'll talk about provisioning clusters and the features that are inside there for being able to manage and monitor clusters. We'll talk about some of the extensibility features we've been working on in the platform. So how do you actually extend what Mari supports from the stacks it installs, the services that you manage well as how you can customize the bar. And then we'll talk about really where it is today in terms of releases and what's what's coming up from there. So at the, the highest level we're, we're trying to achieve with Ambari is, is provide a 100% open source tool to be able to provision, manage, and monitor clusters. And so from the provisioning perspective, we want to make it easy for people to go grab this tool and be able to install a cluster, you know, whether it's a cloud or a virtual or really bare metal type environment. And from the management perspective, we wanted to give people a way to have a single point to manage Hadoop clusters so that, uh, you know, when you really think about Hadoop, it's not one thing, it's a dozen different things. Can, it, can Amari help bring together all those things, put a defined life cycle around them, and give people a single integration point to manage all the different components of Hadoop? So can Amari help with that? And then ultimately, can it also define how do you monitor a Hadoop cluster? give people the plug points to know this is what you should care about when you're monitoring your cluster and this is what you should look at and watch in terms of knowing the health of your cluster and, and how well it's performing. So really trying to bring all that together in the open source. So from an open source perspective, uh, today we've had a little over 60 different contributors contribute to the project, about 30 committers right now. Um, the user group's really grown over the past year since we initiated it. And we've done really a few different releases. So the project was introduced about almost two and a half years ago to Incubator. And uh, this time, or actually January last year, we did really kind of like the foundation release we've been building off of since, which was uh, Amari 1.2.0. And that was really kind of the foundation of what we have today to install Hadoop 1 stacks. And we kind of built up from there. And in October this year, we added support for Hadoop 2 stacks. So you are able to pick up uh, Hadoop 2, HDFS, Yarn, MapReduce 2, and, and those pieces. And then in December this, this past year, we actually just became a top-level project with Apache. So really kind of like big milestones for us. In releasing it, yes? Are you guys supporting HBase as well? Uh, HBase as well, yes. Uh, from Yarn? Uh, not on Yarn, no, not yet. So that's so. Hortonworks has Hortonworks as a company has invested in getting HBase to run on Yarn, um, and there's been a Hoya initiative around that, and that code is actually public and out there. And so um, that stuff is really something that we've been driving. Uh, but from an Amari perspective, we're still installing and managing a traditional HBase stack or service as part of your your cluster. Uh, so this is one question, and the second question is, uh, would we have some problems with cloud there because it's very convenient, everything is great. The problem is you can't keep anything underneath the cloud there manager. 
And it's not obvious always how to do minimal changes with Cloud Era Manager. How do you guys address this problem? So when you say minimal changes, you mean? Uh, I want to upload my own charts. Okay. Okay. I, I want to change configuration in one place. Yeah. Okay. So actually, when we dive into some of the features that are there today, it might hit some of those points, as well as talk about some of the extensibility features of how we're trying to let people bring their own stuff to the table together with a defined stack. So from our perspective, we sit here and say, Ambari's today is this platform that has to know about a stack and all the things that are inside of it, but then you're also always going to bring your own stuff to that stack as well. So we have to think about how people can do that. So when I talk about stacks, you'll see how we're trying to make that easier for people to do. So from a release cadence, uh, we actually release pretty often in the community. So last year we might have done 12 or so releases, kind of running at a six week sprint, four to six weeks, all depending on what's happening. Um, this year we've actually done a couple releases and we picked up some features, we picked up some bug fixes, continually trying to improve the platform. Uh, so the next things we're looking at is we're looking to do an Amari release in the community, probably call for a vote at the beginning of April, and then a six weeks for now we'll do another one and we kind of follow up with them. So this um, April release, so actually what I'm going to show you today, I'm using what's in Trunk today, so it's based on this April release, so you get an idea of what's already in the project and sitting there in Trunk. That will be the basis of the 150 release. How was the Amari package with Microsoft and the Teradata and the other private label versions? Uh, good question. So uh, with Microsoft um, and Teradata, so with, actually let's take the Microsoft one first. So they came to us and Hortonworks works pretty closely with them um, through a bunch of different avenues. But what Microsoft wanted to do was have their system center tooling be able to provide a view of Hadoop clusters and be able to really monitor the health of Hadoop clusters. So they had a couple choices there. They could have gone and went and done point integrations to all the different components. How do I get metrics together? How do I know how all the components spit off their metrics? How do I collect all those things? But when they looked at Apache Ambari, they sat there and said, I can actually go and install an Ambari server in front of a new cluster, and I'll tell it where everything's laid out inside the cluster, and then I only have to integrate with the Ambari REST API, and then I can create a management pack on top of it. And so that's actually a contribution that is inside of the, the open source Ambari, the SCOM management pack that's there. So you can go grab the SCOM management pack, and if you have an existing Hadoop cluster, put the Ambari server in front of it, install your management pack in the system center, point it to that Ambari server, then you have a picture of the, of the layout of the cluster, metrics are available, and it wires up alerts inside of that piece there. So they used it for the REST API so they could have one integration point. Similar to the Teradata case. So they looked at Ambari and said, I could do all these point integrations, but um, when the Hadoop cluster is there, if I have an Ambari server in front of it, and I put viewpoint in front of that, I just have to integrate with one API, and Amari makes it transparent to me where it's getting the metrics from, where all the components are laid out, and things like that. So that's how it's kind of worked. And we also, and we'll talk about it later, but um, we've done work in the OpenStack community as well. So there's uh, OpenStack, um, and inside of there, there's the Horizon portal, and it has a plugin that's called Savannah that's really targeted about laying down the new clusters. We've been contributing there, and Apache Ambari is also used inside of there to be able to install Hadoop in an OpenStack environment. So the Savannah piece actually will go and ask OpenStack infrastructure for VMs and then give those over to Ambari and say now put the Hadoop infrastructure on top of it. So we've been contributing there as well. But it was a case where Savannah said, I can go and figure out how to put all this together or I can let Ambari do the install for me. So that's how we work it out. So instead of just talking about features, I'll just show you the, the product and you can get a sense of how it works. So what I've actually done here is I've already, I'm running three local VMs and I've already done a cluster install on those three VMs. And so we'll talk about how I got here after I show you what the end result is. Um, but really what I've done is I have an Ambari server, it has three nodes, I've installed a cluster on it, and I'm pointing to that Ambari server right now and I'm gonna look at the Ambari web interface. So the first thing I'm going to do is actually log into the web interface. And out of the box, Ambari supports kind of a local user store for authentication. But you know, most people that we see out there come and plug in LDAP or Active Directory because Ambari supports that pluggability and configuration. So after I've kind of logged in and landed into the cluster, I get a picture of a dashboard. So it kind of collects a lot of 
key metrics that we've also wired up alerts against and rolls them up into a dashboard view. So what's your RPC latency? How, what's the health of all my data nodes? Uh, what's my heap size on my name node? How much HDFS capacity do I have available? It also gives me a picture of all the different services I've installed. So in this one here, I've done kind of a traditional 2.0 stack. So HDFS, Yard, MapReduce2, HBase, and right down the line. So what I have here in this dashboard view is a quick view of all the different services that, that are installed, what's the health of the master components on those services, and key metrics that I want to be able to see. So it's getting all these different metrics from different parts of the cluster. Sometimes it's going and asking the name node for some of its metrics. Sometimes it's getting it from Ganglia, which has been pre-wired into the cluster. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it's really transparent. It comes through one API, so we give you some visualization of that when you land on this dashboard. You can kind of see here that there are services that are running, so that means they have daemons associated with them. So in the case of name node, secondary name node for HDFS, resource manager for Yarn, the history server for MapReduce2, kind of all the way down the line, as well as the, the different clients you have installed, so your big client or your screen client. Um, once you kind of like get this high level picture of your cluster, uh, there's also a way to view it from a heat map perspective. So there are a lot of metrics that are available. So Ganglia collects a lot of metrics from Hadoop, as well as it collects system metrics. We rolled a few of them up into some heat maps, into the UI. So we look to make this more extensible in the future. We picked probably the, you know, the most popular, like two dozen or dozen or so heat maps people would want to see when they have a big cluster. So system level stuff of disk space or memory usage, and then actually component level stuff, like tell me um, the garbage collection time on all my data nodes, or the garbage collection time on all my node management. And kind of like flipping it and not thinking at the host level, you can actually go and look at the services themselves and get kind of like a double click into each specific service. So here I'm looking at HDFS, and I kind of get a summary picture of what's going on inside of HDFS. Name nodes up, it is, is up, secondary name nodes up, the two data nodes that are part of this cluster are up, summary information about it, and then all the different health checks that we've wired up as part of this install. Just so out of the box, we've wired up some service level met, uh, alerts to watch. Is the name node running? Can I access the name node UI? What's the percentage of my data nodes that are running? Um, and the RPC latency are just some examples there. But so all these alerts are wired up, out of the box, and configured. And so they're available here, so you kind of get this dashboard. Any of them goes in critical state, you'll get an alert. The UI will also show the alert to you here, but it'll also fire off something to you. Here we're actually showing some of the metrics that are available. There's a lot that are available in the API. We've rolled some of them up into graphs specific to the service. So, you know, what's my file off, my block status, RPC latency, garbage collection, things like that. So, you know, each one of these are available in the dashboard. And this is actually all getting collected in Ganglia. So we wired up Ganglia to the system. And then Ganglia will collect them all and aggregate them and give us different views of it over time. But there's just so many different metrics available. We tried to pick the key six or, or, or so that you want to see on a dashboard. So a lot of people potentially, they look at this dashboard here, great to see these six metrics that are available. There's so many more in the API, they might also wire other alerts or other watches direct to the API if they want to. There's just so much under the hood that's available. Some of the controls I have available for a service. Um, so with the service itself, you know, I obviously have my stop and start and restart all. Uh, we support moving around the master components, so if you can move your name node around for a hardware refresh or some hardware maintenance, you can do that. If you've enabled name node HA, you know, you won't have your secondary name node, but you have two name nodes, you may able to move those around independently if you need to. Um, we also support uh, rolling restart, so you can actually go and initiate a restart for all your data nodes and uh, do it in batch sizes with a tolerance failure as well as pick up configs. There's also a concept of maintenance mode. Yes? Are you already supporting name node federation? Uh, not yet. Not at this time. Yep. We haven't added that here. So I think you can still run, um, you can configure that yourself directly, uh, but not the room bar. So, um, and will you see it or no? I'm sorry? Will you see it? So if I care. Right now, we're, we're looking for the one name node, or if you have HA, we'll look for two name nodes. 
So we're going to have to add the ability to support multiple name nodes once you have the federation enabled. So you could do it, but then you'll be limited to some of the things you can do in Amari. So you might have to step out of managing the name nodes directly from the Amari interface once you configure more than one name node. We also added support for a maintenance mode. So you can put a service in maintenance mode, you can put a host in maintenance mode. So you can sit there and say, hey, I want to do some work on this, this service or I want to do some work on this host. Let me suppress the alerts and still give me control of it. And then keep it from getting caught up in any bulk operations you do. So if you're going to do a bulk restart of data nodes or you're going to do a rolling restart of data nodes, how can you ignore those things? So there's a way to put services in maintenance mode. You know, for example, here I have HBase in maintenance mode. It's running right now, um, but I can sit here and go and basically stop HBase if I wanted to. And it will go and queue up that operation and go out there and stop the, the master component as well as all the region servers. And I won't get any alerts on that. So this is a case where I want to go and reconfigure name node or reconfigure HBase, but not actually do anything. Right. I know I don't want to respond to any alerts. From a configuration perspective, uh, so we support being able to push different configurations and manage configurations. <coughs> Uh, across all the different components in the cluster. So out of the box, every host is part of a default group. So in this case here, I have a default group for HDFS. So it has different configurations for name node, secondary name node, data node, some general configuration, all the different advanced properties that might be associated, as well as I can inject any custom properties I need in, directly into core site or HDFS. Um, also support modifying log4j and being able to push that out as well. There are cases where uh, you might want to target configs to different machines. And so the scenario we've seen a lot is people have 100 nodes in their cluster. They're going to add a new rack. These are the new next-gen hardware, more memory, more drives. We support being able to set up host configuration groups. So you can actually go and create a, a new configuration group. So I'll just do one here, so like new data nodes. And I'll take one of my existing data nodes and add it. So I'll save all of that. So now I actually have the default group as well as one data node in, a, in its own group. It inherits all the default settings, but I can go and say, okay, for this data node itself, let me go and configure its heap size differently. So if it had more memory, I could do a higher number as an example. I'll go save this change, and then a bar will say, now you need to go restart that host and pick up these configs. So I could go and say, let just go restart it to pick up the configs. Or I could have done a roll and restart if it affected more than one data node. You know, so Ambari will stage the change in the Ambari server, and then you'll be able to push it out when you do your restarts. So then, when we did this configuration change here, Ambari stored it, versioned it, and also left an audit trail for it too. So it keeps that version name, the configuration change in the Ambari database. It also uh, spits to a log for j so you can have an appender there that says so and so changed from this and that. From the API, you can. So we do want to add to the UI kind of a history of changes, so then you can see when uh, things were changed, then be able to compare, and then say, now I want to go back to that one. So we have the history in the database, we just have to throw it to the UI. What about if I wanted to clone the whole configuration for a brand new cluster and then export it for release? You can do it from the API today, uh, but there's actually a feature I'm going to talk about a little bit later called Blueprints. That's, that's one of the exact things that we want to be able to do. Um, so I'll talk about that one a little bit. Similar models follow here for all the different services. So Yarn has its summary information. It has its configuration. I can do configuration groups. It's got move for its master service. It supports rolling restart of the node managers and right down the line. So Ambari, you know, kind of has, was able to standardize the lifecycle around each component so it can support all these different things for each service that comes along with the stack. Kind of not thinking at the service level anymore, but thinking at the host level. Um, here's kind of a host view, so I just have three hosts in this cluster. I have the ability to do my filtering and searching and kind of narrowing my list of hosts that I want to see. So I can do it by you know name or IP or what component it actually has on it if I wanted to. Based on what's showing here, I can apply bulk operations. So for all my hosts, start and stop all the components, for all the data nodes in the cluster. You know, do a start and stop or do bulk decommissions if I need to. I can do it to all the hosts, the 
filtered hosts, so the ones that are showing in this list, or selected ones. I don't have to <coughs> select it. I want to select this one, and I can say, okay, go and do that, this, this set of hosts. So it just gives you a way to do bulk operation against hosts. So either at the host level or the individual component level. I can see that this host actually has some components on it that need a restart. I can see that it also has components that are in maintenance mode. I'll actually double click or go into this host specifically. I actually see all the different components that are running on this host and I can manage each individually. So in the service screen and the host screen, I'm doing it at the host level. Here I actually can go and do starts and stops, restarts, and in the case of like data nodes, I can do decommissions if I want to. In the case of node managers or cache trackers, if you're using a new one, I can do decommissions if I need to. Same thing for region servers. And I can do individual component controls. As well as I have some host level actions I can do here. Stop all the components on this host, start all of them, restart. Put this whole host in maintenance mode. I'm going to take this one offline. I can change memory or fix a NIC. Um, or delete this host, take it out of the cluster completely. So all those operations are available. Since I have so many components on this host, there's actually host-specific alerts that are wired up. So before, it was about watching the service overall, like HDFS overall or Yarn overall. This is actually, we have a bunch of alerts that get wired up to actually watch specific components on the host. So let me make sure that the ganglia server's running on this guy, or the ganglia monitors that are feeding the metrics to the ganglia server are running. My high meta store is running on this host, all those different things. So I have a lot of different controls here at the service level and the host level from the UI. And I should step back and also say the way we've actually architected this is the UI is actually a full JavaScript app running in the browser and it's just using the REST API to do all this. So anything you see here in the UI you can actually do from the API. So it kind of is also self-documenting self for us. So, you know, if you feel like looking you can always go and watch all the different uh, firebug net traffic if you feel like watching it how to make a REST call. So go and do a DCOM, see what we call. You know how to do a DCOM now from the REST API. From an admin perspective, um, there's the, the ability to enable name node HA. So this will introduce the second name node into the cluster, take the secondary name node out, and then ultimately it will show the two name nodes active standby for you. It also adds more alerts then. So we'll watch the second name node and watch uh, the zookeeper controllers in the back, and watch the journal nodes that are helping with name node HA. From a security perspective, you can enable Kerberos in this cluster. So this allows you to kind of walk through a wizard and helps you go and choose all the different principles and key tabs that are going to be associated with Kerberos across all the different services. And then at the end of the day, you're able to get this picture of, I need all these principles, I need all these key tabs, hand it to my security team, they go and generate that stuff, they put it in place, you come back and apply, we'll put out all the configs, restart the services, and then you have a Kerberos cluster. Yeah, I have a question. Oh, sorry, after you. I was going to ask, is not after you've done the Kerberos, it gives you an option for Knox, or that's not? Uh, that's not right? here today. So the, and so Knox is actually kind of like, you could do Knox whether you've done Kerberos or not. You know, so you have a choice there. So once we do add Knox support here, you'll have a choice whether you want to introduce Knox to the cluster. Yeah, uh, when uh, you mentioned uh, high availability, you, you were talking about secondary name node. I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, there is no no uh, secondary name node when it comes to uh, high, high availability. It's uh, the standby name node and the active name node. Correct, yeah, so it's the second name node. Yeah, so yeah, you mean the two. standby, okay. Right, yeah, so we add the second name node, <coughs> we delete the secondary name node, and then it is active standby. Yeah, but there is no secondary name node. There is no secondary name yes, node. Exactly. We delete that one. Nice. So as you walk through the wizard, you tell us where you want the second name node, and you show us where you want your journal nodes, and then we'll say, okay, this is what we're adding. This is what we're about to remove. So we'll remove the secondary name node, and then apply the configs. Yeah, does it enforce from the GUI that you need to have at least three nodes for the Quran, for the journal needs? It, 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 it enforces that you need at least three for the journal. Right. Yeah. So, uh, kind of give me an idea. Just a namespace. I can go sit here and say I'm going to add an additional name node, and then I'm going to set up my journal nodes where they're going to end up in my cluster. And then it's saying, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to. That's where your current name node is. That's where your secondary name node. I'm going to delete. 
I'm going to add this new name node in and add these three into the cluster. And these are the configs I'm going to adjust accordingly as well to make it happen. Kind of get a picture of what I've installed. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Like the curve at all, it's not changed. This is 1.5. This is 1.5. That looks like it's changed by one. Which one? 1.4. Okay, yeah, it's, I think we've done a lot really here since um, we're moving pretty quickly with some of the enhancements here. And even some stuff under the hood we can talk about as well that I'll, I'll get to. But yeah, so with the six week sprints, we're moving pretty quickly with adding features. From a cluster perspective, so I actually installed with uh, HTTP 2.0 as the stack I chose when I did my install. And you know that's where I got the repositories. And we'll talk a lot more about stacks in a little bit, so what that means to Ambari and what that means to extensibility. And then miscellaneous, so when I did my initial install, these are the users that I wanted the different component processes to run under. So that was configurable as well, and this is what I ended up choosing. That's kind of like a rundown of the UI side and the different uh, service and host level trolls that are available. Uh, there's also uh, the API side of this that's, that's available. So I showed that a little bit in Firebug, but just to give you an idea of how it lays out, I'm pointing to that same Ambari server. I'll make it a little bit bigger. That same Ambari server, and I'm looking at that cluster via the API. So I can see all the different versions of the configs. I can see all the different operations that have been performed against that cluster. I can see all the different services that are installed in that cluster. So I can see it has H catalog, H base, HDFS, Hive. Those different services are installed. And I like double clicking into one of them. So if I went into H base itself, I can see here that for HDFS, there are some metrics that are available and alerts that are available, as well as um, I see all the different components that are associated with HDFS and that they're installed. So if I wanted to go and see, for example, where all my data nodes are in my cluster. I'd go look at HDFS components data node, and then I can go and see metrics specific to data nodes, and then I have a data node on this host and a data node on this host, and then I can keep drilling in from there. So it follows a you know, pretty simple resource structure of cluster services components, and then there's kind of on the side of that hosts that you can go specifically and look at. That's kind of a picture of the Ambari web interface and the features and a picture of the API that's there. Um, taking a step back and actually looking at it from a, an architecture perspective. From a system architecture perspective, you have an Ambari server that has a database that's storing configurations and topology information. It has the REST API that it's exposing as well as the web interface that's using that REST API. And then ultimately it's paired with Ambari agents that are running on the hosts in the, in the cluster. And if you're to double click inside there from a, a server architecture, the agents themselves are Python agents. The database that's holding configuration topologies of Mari supports MySQL, Oracle, or Postgres out of the box is the one that comes with it. Um, then it exposes the REST API. The web interface is the full JavaScript front end. The Amari server itself is a Java server, so we get platform independence there. That's how come in the Windows environments they can run the Amari server today and have it sit in front of a cluster that might even be running on Windows, as an example. And then the authentication provider, where out of the box we have a user store, but you can always plug in LDAP or Active Directory. So we saw a running cluster, like what's it take to actually install one of these? So to kind of give you the, the hit list of the top five things. Uh, first you have to install your Mari server. So you go, install your Ambari server, then you have some options. So you can take the default path and just choose everything by default. Uh, but some of the choices you have are, which JDK do I want to use? So you can have Ambari get the JDK for you, whether you want JDK 6 or JDK 7, or whether you want to bring your own JDK to the table. So uh, you might already have the JDK installed on the boxes, just tell us where it is and that's the one we'll use. Which database do I want to use? So you can use the default Postgres that comes out of the box, or you can say, hey, I want to use an existing MySQL or an existing Oracle. That. How heavy is the server? How heavy is the server? How big of a machine I need? Is it one, or can I have load balancing all these things? Right now it is one. It so is it one. has to be one? It is one. Uh, we haven't done load balancing um, from it because we still have to work out the agent communication and the state it's maintaining related to the agent action queues. 
Uh, once we do that, we'll be able to support high availability for Lombardi servers. So it's something we want to do, but we haven't done it yet. How big of a machine do I need to Lombardi server? Depends on the cluster size. For the most part, not you know, it can handle pretty big cluster. Like we've actually done some thousand node clusters with a single Lombardi server and a single gangway server, all co-hosted on the same machine. Uh, that's what I'm asking. How much memory does somebody server have? That's a good question. Um, I actually don't have that answer. Answer for you. But it's pretty lightweight. From the, you can scale your cluster way out, and the Ambari server handles it pretty well. I think the big thing here that we've offloaded is metrics collection, the actual operation of collecting metrics and storing all the metrics. The Ambari server stores topology, configuration information, and then we leave metrics collection to Gangway. So that at least offloads a lot of work for us. Yeah. What about the database size? Uh, it doesn't grow that rapidly since we're not doing all metrics collection. So uh, you are not doing historical, right? Not for metrics. It's we do have it in Ganglia, mm -hmm. but not in the MRI database itself. So it usually is pretty lightweight. For a Mari server, after you've stood it up and run it, you have some choices there. What port do you want it to listen on? Do you want to enable SSL? How do I want to wire up the user authentication? Do I want to set up two-way SSL between the server and agent? So do I want to secure down and make registration out of a two-way process when agents come in and register with the host? And then after I've chosen all those options, I start my Mari server, then I go to the Mari web interface, and I actually get a cluster install wizard and I can actually start doing a cluster install. So I'm actually going to demo that next. But you know, one thing I did want to highlight and talk about, um, Ambari agents have to get on these machines to be able to talk to the Ambari server so we can help orchestrate getting packages on the boxes and getting everything with its configurations and getting them started. We give people two options to do that. They have a way of doing it like asking the Ambari server to do it for them. So that means they have SSH between the machines. They let the Ambari server go and log in and do it via SSH, or users do it manually. They put the agents on the boxes first and start the processes and have them come back and talk to the server. We've seen it happen in both cases, probably 50-50. All depends on what people's SSH requirements are inside of their network environments. Uh, if yeah, I have yeah, somebody yeah. work with uh, any Hadoop distribution, <laughs> or uh, is it agnostic when it comes to the Hadoop? We've been designing it to be agnostic. You know, here at Hortonworks, we've implemented stacks for HTTP, but our stack definitions are actually separated from the Ambari implementation so that people can bring other stacks to the project. And that's what we really hope to see, is they'll not just bring other stacks, they'll bring other services to the table that people can take advantage of. So if I'm bringing the new node, it has to have an agent, and the agent finds a button server, not a server. That's one, yeah, that's one, uh, one way to do it. So you can bring the node with the agent already on it, and it come and re comes and registers with the server. So every agent has to know about the body server, but not vice versa. Not vice versa. So it's always the agents coming back to the server and asking for commands. Uh, you know, since they, they do some pretty heavy operations, we just wanted to avoid people being able to arbitrarily send commands to agents and then do rogue things on boxes. So even though we're protecting the channel and they have a two-way SSL and all that certificate exchange, if you want to do that, we still always wanted to make it the agent comes back to get its commands versus someone being able to get the Ambari server and then just start shooting arbitrary things down to the agents. Do you run out of VM? Yes, you can. Yep. When it comes to those two options, they end up showing up in the wizard like this. You have your choice between SSH, or you have a choice between manual, meaning I put the agent on the boxes myself. So again, people have different SSH requirements in their environments. If they can do it, they do SSH. In other places, they already they, they preload the agents, and they have their administrators have those on the machines that are calling back to the server, so that when they come to this wizard, they just choose manual, and all of those get registered. To give you an idea of some of the flow that happens here, if you choose SSH, the Ambari server itself uses SSH to connect to that box, tell it where the Ambari repository is to be able to get the agent code. It actually All right, so our speed goes and executes a setup script that will go install the Ambari agent, configure it to know how to find the server, and then it starts it, and then the agent registration process begins. So Ambari agent initially just the script that goes to the server. So there's a script that gets the agent on the box. 
and then we start. That gets, there's a script that we run to get the agent on the box and get it started. Okay. Then it comes back to the server and says, all right, I'm here, I'm ready to register with you. Um, and this is what happened in one step in the wizard. So you're, you're saying about some code being downloaded in the yep. of the server. Yep, so after it comes in and registers with the server, it actually has some of that flow coming up here, so you'll see the detail of what happens there. If I did it manually, there's no SSH at all. The user goes and does the agent, puts it on the box, starts it up, and says, hey, I want to register. Regardless of whether you did it manual or SSH, once the agent's running, it does the registration. So if you have two-way SSL on, and you want the certificate exchange, the agent will go connect on a different port, pick up a certificate, disconnect, come back to the, the registration port, share that certificate, and then ultimately come back and say, this is who I am, you're welcome, you, you said I was allowed to be here, the agent's now connected with that server. This is also the point where um, Ambari, which is separate from its stack definitions, are separate from the Ambari server itself, the agent will pull down the stack definitions so it knows how to install different stacks that are available. So since the agent registers, it grabs that stuff from the server. I actually have a few slides on that in a bit, and we'll talk about that mechanic. So I actually want to try to do a cluster install here. Let's see how this goes. So I actually um, set up a single local VM. Uh, so what I'll do is I've already gone and installed my Ambari server, <coughs> and I chose, you know, really not that magical of an options. When my first log in here, it's starting me on the wizard saying, there's no cluster that I'm aware of. So do you want to actually go install a cluster? So I'll go install my cluster here. Click next. I'm going to choose my stack. This is dynamically read from the stack definitions that are available. And in this server, I only have these three stack definitions that are defined. We'll talk a lot more about stacks in a couple slides. So it read those stack definitions. It knows where the repositories are for those different stacks. I can go and override these. So if I'm doing a no internet install, I can go and put my own repositories in here and use my local repository instead. But I'll use the public repositories here. I'll click next. So I'm actually going to install my cluster on this single host. And I'm going to use SSH. So I go and say register and confirm. So right now, the Ambari server itself is actually going back out to itself and saying, hey, I want to get this agent on the box. So it SSH into itself and goes. And what we'll see start happening is some of that flow we talked about. It connects to the box. It gets the agent installed. It gets the agent started. It comes back and actually starts registering with this host. And then ultimately it said, yep, I'm here. I'm ready to go. You said you wanted to add C6404 to the cluster. It's got an agent on it, and it's ready to start accepting the do bits. It also runs some host checks. So it went and saw what's on the host that could potentially be a problem. So it made sure that based on the repositories you provided in the stack selection step, do I actually have repositories for the soft, for the OS that this machine is? It checks and see if you have IP tables running, potentially. So you know, make sure your network configuration's right. And then it checks other things. So what packages might you have installed? Um, are there other processes running that might conflict? You know, so again, we've just found a lot of scenarios where people come along, they grab Ambari, it's a test install, but who knows what they have already put on there or has been running on there. We just give them a chance to at least go, okay, are these things I should clean up before I do the cluster install? Everything looks good. <coughs> now I get a choice of the different services. So as part of the stack definition, it read that these are the services that are involved, uh, that are available. So I can go and choose whichever level of ones I want. So I can leave off HBase if I want, or I can leave off Uzi if I want. Um, part of this stack definition includes Nagios and Ganglia. So they are with HDP and Hortonworks. You know, we have our traditional Hadoop stack. We also have Nagios and Ganglia as, as an add-on to that. And so that stack definition includes the non using Gagria. I'll leave those in here. I get a choice of where to put all my, my different master components, one host, so I don't actually have a lot of choices. I can choose where I want my data node and node managers to run, as well as where I want client containers, one host, not a lot of choices. Then I actually go and am able to customize each service. So kind of similar to what we saw in the management interface. I have the ability to go and change configs. So for Hive, out of the box, 
uh, we give you a choice to say, do you want me to put MySQL in the cluster? I'll put MySQL in the cluster for you. How do you want to configure? Or do you want to use an existing MySQL infrastructure or work on infrastructure if you want to? For Nagios, I have to tell it, um, how do I want the administrator for Nagios to be configured? And when emails, when alerts fire, who should I email? This is also where I could customize the usernames that all the processes would run under. So we found that some people use the same one. In some people's environments, they need custom ones, so at least we give them a choice here. Ultimately, I get a chance to review. So it's going to install one host using these repos, installing these services, and these are where the master components are going to land. And then I go and click deploy. It'll queue up the tasks, and then it will go and run through this wizard. And it'll sit here and go install all the different components. So it gets all the packages on the box first. And my internet connection isn't that good, so I'm going to the public repository, so we'll see how it goes. Um, and we also won't sit through and watch this thing run, but at the end of the day, first it goes and gets all the packages on the box, then it goes and pushes all the configs to the boxes, then it goes and starts all the processes for you. And then at the end, it runs a little smoke test against each one, and then you're out of the wizard. Now you're into cluster management. So data nodes starting to install, so it's doing initial data node stuff, probably trying to reach the public repos. Uh, trying to grab you know 50 meg files over your phone hotspot is probably going to take a while. So, but you get the idea. It will flow through here, and then ultimately I'd end up with a running cluster. Yes. Uh -huh. <coughs> I thought Uzi was also part of the DPP. Uh, yeah, it is, and I unchecked that when I did the install. So I, I unchecked HBase and Uzi. Post install, Amari supports add service, so I could have added it in. Right, because this is probably the hardest installation possible. It's yes. <laughs> so yeah, so it was there. I just unchecked it by default, just to show you can choose. Afterwards, there's an ad service. <coughs> yes. Python, please. Sorry. It's Python, please. Uh, Python is actually how the agents are running. You support three. three. It's two dot six or greater right now. Including three. Uh, I don't know if we tested it with three or not. I know it just makes sure we have 2.6 at minimum. Yeah, well, it's a thousand nodes to be added to the cluster, then it's difficult to go to each one separately. Is there a batch way of doing that? Yep. So uh, when you go to add hosts to the cluster, like, you know, what we've seen people do is do it in batches. Uh, so they go and paste maybe 100 at a time. Um, and what we found is the biggest bottleneck when you're doing installs of that size is actually access to the software repositories. So using the public repositories, trying to do a batch of 100 at a time, and anybody else in the world that's doing it at the same time, you don't want to do that. So you definitely want local repositories when you're doing that. As well as we found that people go and pre-install some of the RPMs on the box, do the bigger RPMs, so that when Avari comes along to install it, it's just like a no-op. It just falls right through. So there are optimizations you can make. So you could do a 1,000 at a time. And actually, Mahadev Kodar, who's one of the um, founders of Fortmarks, and he's a committer on Ambari. Just like last week, he tweeted he was doing a 900 node install. The picture up there, he's like, hey, check me out, you know, kind of thing. So, but, you know, we typically find people do it in batches. Um, and then you can always optimize the network access to the packages. Yeah, uh, yeah. What, what are the prerequisites to uh, uh, install and use Ambari? For example, uh, when it comes uh, to like uh, firewall, the kind of uh, the list of parts that need to be open. What, for example, so is this listed somewhere? Or? Yep. So uh, in the documentation, we talk about the different port requirements. Um, so in Bari server itself, so it's the web interface and the REST API that port access, whether you want it to be HTTP or SSL coverage. Uh, then there's the Asian to server communication, which is over a single port that you can configure there. And then it really comes down to what the stack requires inside of it. So just traditional Hadoop things, what they need to talk to amongst themselves. You know, but the Ambari server requirements are pretty small in terms of you're either talking to the server or the agent's talking to the server. So can you defend the hand basically could be based on the Hadoop Correct, yeah. The services you choose, and then ultimately you can take the default configs out of the box or customize the ports if you want to as well. So you have a lot of choices there. But that is a good point as well to bring up. Uh, Ambari today, we do package and certify uh, it against RHEL, CentOS, Oracle Linux, SLES, 
uh, five and six for the, the CentOS RHEL flavors. It's less 11 for the less flavor. Uh, in the community, we're working on Ubuntu right now, and then we're also starting to work on Windows. You know, we ultimately want Amari to be able to sit in front of really any type of platform cluster. The Oracle support, obviously we talked about before, Postgres, MySQL, Oracle, different JDKs, JDK 6, 7, OpenJDK, if you want to bring that to the table. So we have different choices there. From a browser perspective, if you plan to use the web interface, uh, it's IE9 or above. I believe it's IE9. Is that right, Paul? Okay. Yep. IE9 or above, Firefox, Chrome, Safari, those things. Yes? Is there a way to make an API call to pull out a specific configuration? So, uh, I want the configs that are on this host. But it, well, I want to know all the ports that these different services are going to use, for example. There, there's a way to call it. it. It's not as explicit as just tell me the ports. But you would be able to make calls to say, these are the configs I want. And you would know which ones to call. Could use it. It would be a it could be that way. Correct. No, correct. Yeah, because it's like on HDFS, it's like DFS dot at HTTP address, like all the different properties. You could just grab them and grab the ports off them. So we talked a lot of it, at least I mentioned a lot about stacks. I actually want to talk about them a little bit more in a little more detail. Um, when it comes to Ambari stacks. Uh, we really wanted to make sure the Ambari project could stand alone from the stack it installs, because it's an open source project. We want to make sure it has as much opportunity for anyone to come along and add services and stacks to it. Uh, so, we spent a, so we spent a lot of time with how do we define a stack? How do we put a life cycle around a stack so that it has you know, a consistent way to manage services that are part of a stack? And then ultimately, that sets us up to make it easier to dynamically add things a stack so that Ambari can take it under support um, without having to have people go and hard code stuff into Ambari server in Java, hard code stuff into the agents which are in Python. They have a way to go and plug into Ambari and you know, not necessarily, it's something they need, not necessarily something they have to go contribute back to the community, but at least it helps give them a plug point. So what's fundamental to this is this idea of stacks where we have the Ambari server and the agents, and in between them is this stack definition. And a stack definition really talks about where do I get the packages to install this stack, and what's actually inside this stack, so what services are there. And then each service has its own definition around it, and then there's actually a defined life cycle around each service. How do I start it, how do I stop it, how do I get status on it, how do I install this service, and how do I configure it. Those are kind of like the basic life cycle commands we need to support. So we put that around each individual service. Then uh, those things actually get wrapped up in command scripts. So those are Python based. So they come along with the stack definition. You could always add custom commands. So there's the basic five, but then there's always things that are specific to a service. For example, you know, rebalance is specific to HDFS. They need a way to add that lifecycle command. We end up supporting that custom command. Then there's also the ability of saying, there's a stack out in the community that I like that has everything I want. It's got HDFS, it has Yard, it has everything I want, but I want it to also have this. I can take that base level stack and extend it and say, oh, okay, make my stuff additive, and now Amari would be able to take that under management. So what ends up happening is the stack definitions they kind of give you the idea of how they actually look from a code perspective. So I will switch over to here. In the Ambari code, you know, here at Gordonworks, we've written stacks for HDP. And so to get an idea for this stack, that's HDP, this is out on the public Ambari GitHub uh, that mirrors the Apache repos. I have a picture of this stack definition. And if I go and actually look at what's inside of this stack, I can go and see that these services are available in the stack. So it defines that HDFS is part of HDP. That HBase, Hive, Gangly, Nagus are all part of HDP. Each individual service, so if I went and dove into HDP, HDFS, has bed info, so it describes the service itself. So here I see that for HDFS, it has a name node. And here's its command script, it's this Python file. So that's for the basic lifecycle commands. It has also a custom command for decommissioning. 
It has data nodes, and it hears its basic lifecycle commands, secondary, and its lifecycle commands. It has a client. It could be journal nodes associated with it, zookeeper failover controllers if you have HA enabled. But this describes the service and tells you where to get the command scripts that are associated with it. So all of this is living inside of this stack definition. The command scripts themselves are also part of the stack definition, so just part of the package that comes with this service inside of this stack. I can go and take a look at the actual name node command script, and you can see it maps pretty well to what we consider the lifecycle. There's an install method, a start method, a stop method, configure status, and then there's a custom command decommission that we define. So at the end of the day, I've actually been able to go and put a wrapper around what's it mean to have a stack, what's inside of the stack, where are the command scripts to do it, and they all actually live on the Ambari server. So what ends up happening is, when I go and start my Ambari server, it reads what stacks are available, which have been defined on the server there. So it could have been what came out of the box by default that's out in open source, or you could have put your own stack definition in place. Or you might have extended one and add your own service to it or whatever. And the Ambari server, as you're going across the that wizard, it starts sending commands down to the agent that says, hey, I want you to install this stack and HDFS from it. So the agent goes, oh, great, I don't know how to do that. Give me the definition for how to do that and give me all the command scripts for it. So it goes back to the server and pulls all that down dynamically. So the people who want to contribute here didn't have to go and make sure it got packaged in the agent out of the gate. They didn't have to go and contribute their stack to the Ambari project. They're able to go and do that. It pulls down the command scripts and executes the command and kind of goes from there. So if you've asked it to do an install, it'll execute that install command. Start and stop, same thing. If you change stuff in that definition right there in the center that's living on the Ambari server, so down the road you decide to change what start means, like maybe you want more logging or debugging, um, you make that change, and actually today you have to do an Ambari server restart, um, but we'll make it more dynamic in time. When the agent comes back in and checks in, it'll recognize the change and re-pull the code down to the agents. So you don't have to go distribute it to all your different machines if you change the definition of start. So you know, this really makes it a lot easier for people to come and deploy stacks, and extend stacks, and add services that go under Amari management without having to go and touch a lot of places in the code and keeps it in one package. How often do the agents check for status changes like that? So they're actually heart beating back. It's configurable, but we haven't set for six seconds right now. So when they when you actually the way that mechanically it does it, when you change the when you start the service, it creates a cache bundle of all the stack definitions. And the agent checks in and grabs that if it doesn't have them, but it needs something. Um, it won't re-get those if those haven't changed. When you restart the service, it will rebuild the cache bundle, and when the agent checks in that first time, it'll pull down if it needs it. So, so, so if I understand correctly, the stack is a collection of services. Yeah, every service has the support set of the start, stop. Okay. How do you determine which uh, node is running which service? Yep. So this has to be uh, somewhere on the side. Yep, so that's actually a great segue. <laughs> um, uh, this is just the definition of what's there and the bits. You know where you should And then you got to decide what to do with it, like where to put them and how and where you should run them. And so that's actually the that's a great segue there, but I saw a question over here before I... Yeah, uh, have this uh, stack definition and it's a man hand-coded, or do you have like a GUI, you can generate them? Right now they're hand-coded. Yeah. It's hand-coded, so you write the XML, and then you write the Python code. Um, we've got a lot of use out of extensions, though, where as we've been building more stacks that support HDP, we've been able to say, 2.1 extends 2.0, which extends 1, and only do the additive changes to the command scripts and the configs. So that's helped a lot. So you could find that you write a base stack, and then you only really have to tweak it with each release. And in the community, we had the Red Hat folks come along and take HTTP as a base stack, and then add Cluster as a service to it. So in their world, they're able to bring Cluster to the table as part of a stack definition. It didn't have to go do a lot of magic with Ambari. And so this is the stack definition side. So how do I actually get all this stuff on a box and tell it where I want it? That's where Ambari blueprints come into play. This also goes back to the previous question of how do I get a picture of everything that's inside my cluster, where everything's laid out, and how everything's configured. So at the simplest level, what a blueprint is, 
It's a stack plus all the hosts you have. Tell me where you want all that stuff, and that's the blueprint. So I really am saying, use this stack. These are all the hosts I have. This is how I want to lay out all that stuff that's in the stack. There's my blueprint. Now go, hey, Abari, go install that for me. This is actually a feature we've been working on, and it's in the trunk right now, and so we'll bring it out as part of a release, probably in that May release. Um, but the idea here is, People can go and create these blueprints, so stacks plus their hosts, how they want it all laid out, hand it to Amari and actually start automating installs and not have to do the wizard. So they can go and just stand up on Amari server, hand it this blueprint, and it will go and install the bits on the box based on that blueprint you gave it. We also then have the ability to say, I've got an existing cluster, export how this is laid out, and let me go make another cluster just like that once, let me give it to the Amari server. So there's just a bunch of different stuff we can do there. So a lot of people want to start automating installs. A lot of people want to get snapshots of clusters. We can just imagine that people will come along, whether it's internal or part of the project, they'll just have a library blueprint. This is a dev cluster, this is a high load cluster, this is an HBase cluster. They'll have blueprints that they're reusing all the time. And maybe some will get contributed to the community, or they're just really special to people, but we're giving them the ability to do it. The blueprint stuff implemented in Python as well. The blueprint uh, stuff is actually, it's um, it's a definition file that kind of merges the stack plus the um, how you want to lay stuff out. Ultimately, all you do is take that definition file, which I think it's all XML right now. You hand it to the Ambari server via a REST API, and then the server itself does it, and it actually does it server side, which is Java code. It ends up ultimately saying, I'm using this stack, which then uses the stack definitions to execute some of that. But the parsing of the blueprint definition and then sending out the commands is on the Amari server. Your stack definition is really just uh, definition files. Sure, but is the actual, what was the, because I haven't looked at this one, so okay. what, what was, was it written in Python or in Java? Or in Java, so it's the Amari server that's doing this. So just as you would have walked through the wizard and it's calling the REST API to do stuff, which is ultimately calling the stack stuff, which is were written in Python, this is just a short circuit way to do that. So instead of walking through the wizard and making five calls, you just hand in a blueprint and it just automates it for you there. So it's just the Java server and the Python stuff inside of that stack definition. I have a question. Yeah, when you showed the, the, yeah, the use of the wizard, Things are like perfect and working fine. So uh, how would, uh, like uh, uh, errors are being handled? So how? Uh, just uh, just a quick question. Yep. So uh, as it's trying to do each individual step, um, you know we're kind of, we're saying hey let's do a start. We're getting that log information and then ultimately testing that the start completed successfully. That will get log that will show up in the UI as well as we're logging it on each agent and the Ambari server itself is logging. I sent this command down there and it didn't come back successfully. So there's a few different levels. And when we actually have the UI in front of us, we can show some pretty things, that like this one red, red X, stuff like that. When it comes to using blueprints, you submit it, it gives you back a request ID, you can keep checking the progress on that request, then you can go and actually double, double click, and when I say double click, I mean drill through the REST API to go look at all the specific things it's doing. So the same stuff you see in the wizard UI, it is really doing. We just, you know, you have to call it via the REST API. So it's kind of like on you at that point to know, I submitted it, I get this request, these are the things I should be watching to watch progress. You know, but um, in some cases, you know, it will help people do automated installs, um, but they still have to do some work to do the kind of check that we do in the UI. There is no like uh, embedded health check or something like that? There is at the end. Ultimately, at the end, there is a smoke test that gets run. So the blueprint would do the initial install and start everything, and then you would call another API that says run a health check against the services. We didn't make that part of the blueprint itself. In the wizard, we make it a default option, but we kind of leave it to the people. And we'll use blueprints to decide if they want to do health checks at the end. Because typically what will happen is they'll make their little blueprints for dev clusters and things like that. They'll have what they consider a smoke test of that cluster. So they'll go and say, now that I think that cluster's there, go run this map reduce job against it, or go run tower sewers or something like that. So you know they might use the ones we have, they might not. We give them a choice. In the wizard, we don't give them a choice. When they're using the API, they get a choice. I was just curious if you picked Python just to have a cross-platform description. That was the big thing. And it's lightweight. Like we thought about Java, but starting a VM for what these agents do is probably not the best thing. Um, it's also more traceable. Like it's just easier to see. 
Um, we like Python as well because it's, it's nice to unit test individual methods. Uh, the original implementations were actually done with Puppet under the hood. Um, it got us a lot, to, it got us a lot, uh, but it all really ultimately did things we didn't necessarily want it to do. Like when we'd ask it to do one thing, it could do three things or four things in pursuit of stuff. And so it kind of clouded some of the logging. So at least with Python, we're able to make it clean. Like when I want to do this, do this. You know, so um, our use of Puppet was good for, for a time period, but Python's really helped us out a lot. Still using Puppet. It's still there in 1.4.4. In 1.5.0, it's an option, but we've actually migrated all the stacks over. So we've yeah, we got some choices. I was just wondering, did you guys find this performance? we put in place was installing and giving basic management operations to the cluster and then wiring up monitoring. And actually as we start looking out over the next year for Amari, a lot's going to be around being able to help people better tune, yeah. better capacity plan, and better troubleshoot. Yeah. And so it was the other question I had is the logs, like the access logs, the security logs, everything else, where are those located in, in a cluster in Amari? Are those accessible? for analysis or operational analytics or like that, security analytics, where's that data located? So uh, just talking about the Ambari part itself, so the Ambari server log has its Ambari server log. It also has the audit logs for all config changes, as well as access logs. Um, text files, right? They're just log per day, tech files. The agents themselves also, also have logs, so each operation you fire, it's commands, it's output, and it's errors are all there available. They can be collected. And then there's always all the blocks that come along with it as well that are in their individual components. Um, so, how does the version of one of the service changes? Then would it be a new stack? And would it be all installed out? It's a great question. So, right now, um, we've seen, so Ambari actually, after it does the initial install, we still leave it up to the user to handle how they want to manage when they upgrade the stack component. So, they can go on the box and do a young upgrade. And uh, as long as they've matched, they, as long as they know it hasn't changed from what the command scripts needed to be, everything will still work just fine. But if they know they're upgrading to like a new version of Hive that might have changed the way something starts, they have to bring along new uh, command scripts with it. Uh, so we're looking to actually make that a little more automated down the road. It's still a manual effort uh, for us to tell people. But if you want to actually, after we've done the initial install or managing things, you can go and upgrade this stuff yourself in the cluster. <coughs> we think we can make that a lot easier for people. Down the road. At least right now, we're getting the initial install down. Um, we'll automate that in, in a while. This API and this automated install and the blueprint idea is actually key to our OpenStack integration we talked about before. So it's where OpenStack's running, Horizon Portal has Savannah inside of it. It uses the Envara server and via the REST APIs. So Savannah itself plugs into the Horizon Portal. Someone comes in and says, I want to do cluster. Savannah first goes to the OpenStack infrastructure and gets the VMs. Then it says, one of those VMs has an Ambari server on it. This is the stack I want. Go put a dupe on top of it for me, Ambari. So it doesn't use the wizard at all to do it. And then at the end of the day, you have a dupe cluster with Ambari in front of it. So they're using the APIs to do this. Yeah, I have a question. Can Ambari be used in, uh, to install Hadoop in a virtualized environment? Yes, you can. Yep. Yeah, we do a lot of our testing on virtualized environments. Um, so you totally can do that. I think we can make the experience a little bit more seamless for people as well. Uh, but right now, we just treat them as, as machines, even though they might be VMs. The, the most automation we've done is through the, through the Savannah part where we know it's open stack. One other extensibility point I want to touch on with the bar. So we saw the web interface. And we talked about stacks and services, and people are going to bring their own stack and service to the table. Um, when you add a service to a stack, and you kind of adhere to the basic life cycle of a service, that can bleed through to the API because we know what start and stop means. We know how to read that service. That shows up. But there's cases where we've heard people say, I want actually specific tools or custom UI 
and controls that are in front of those services. So how are they going to be able to do that without modifying the Amari web interface? So we're actually making an extension point called Amari Views that lets people plug in UI components into the Amari web interface. So the idea here is they can customize the web experience. They might or might not have added stuff to the stack. Um, so they might add a new service to the stack. It gets its basic operational controls. But then they can also drop a view in place and get a, a UI in front of that that's specific. So the case you might find is you know, uh, when Disco is doing its HA, um, you might want an actual UI to manage that HA from Amari. Because that new cluster is there, I want a UI for when Disco in front of it. You can drop a view in place and do it. That's at least the idea. Same thing for Red Hat with Cluster. Cluster became part of their stack. Um, the Cluster UI to manage Cluster is in its own admin console. Could they blend it into the Amari interface where all the other stack components are? This gives them an option to do that. So just plug in the quick link. Sorry? Does that just plug into the quick link state that already exists, or is it more? more uh, a little bit more than that. So they could have done the quick links. So we think ultimately, people will be, we want to give people the ability to integrate to any part of the UI. I want to add a tab, or I want to add something to the service bar, or whenever we're rendering potentially a pop-up, they have a way to inject, or user settings area where they say press the preferences, they have a way to inject UI in there. We think there's a lot we can do. Our first shot at views is really let people add tabs. That's kind of where we're starting here. So this framework is actually part of Trump today. It's the beginning of it, but I at least wanted to introduce it to you because we talked a lot, a lot about extending Amari at the stack level and under the hood. We're also thinking about how to do it at the UI level. So that be driven by an XML file, for example? Yep, so I'll actually go through that a little bit here. <coughs> so the idea is once you have these different views that are in place, we want to also give the Ambari admin an opportunity to entitle different views to people so that they've been able to drop all these views in place and they can actually say, well, when this person logs in, he gets these three. That person logs in, he gets operational control in these two type thing. So the way it ends up working is developer creates a view. He drops it on the Ambari server. The Ambari admin comes along and makes instances of that view. So actually creates instances of that view and then entitles it out to users. So what we've been thinking from a UI perspective is there's a whole library of views that are available in the Amari web interface. People can go along, pick a view, go and say, I want to make an instance of this, configure it, and then actually give it out to people. So to kind of bring it home how the mechanics end up working, up over here. So this is in Trunk. This is the Amari views work that we've been doing. We have a few your standard hello world weather calculator, we'll get a stock picker up there someday. Standard stuff you say when it comes to UI extensions. Uh, but this is really kind of validating the framework initially. Uh, but so there's some basic views here. And at the end of the day, if I go look at you know the weather view itself, I can actually see that it has a view XML that defines what this view is. So it's a weather view that needs a list of cities and what units do you want to report the weather in. And then um, what resources does it have? So it tells you not only how to register a new UI, it also tells you make a REST API to support that new UI as well. So you can write Java code that gets injected into the server to expose a REST resource if you need to. In this case here, in this view XML, I've actually defined the instances I want. Ultimately, we'll see that more dynamic. It goes and executes the admin interface. So these wouldn't be here, but this is kind of a convenient way for people to do it. But what ends up happening is, I will go to my Ambari server. So I've actually have here, I've deployed two of the views. So I can actually go and see that I have a view called Hello World. The Hello World view has one instance that's been deployed. That instance has been deployed. You know, it's not using any anything magical to it. It doesn't have any server-side resources for a REST API. This thing is pretty simple. All it does is server UI. It says Hello World. So, so I'm able to go instance, give me Hello World. So the idea is, you know, we can go and be a lot more advanced with this um, and kind of show it to you. I'll go and work without the net, but I'll go and put the weather view in place. I'll restart my Envari server to pick up that weather view. We'll come back to that. Um, but the idea here is 
the weather view is really just like the jar file that includes the XML, the server-side Java, the server-side Java that make the resources, UI components that are associated with it. What I will do is switch back over to here. Okay, I'm going to need to re-authenticate. Yep. So go log in. So now I can see the weather view is available. So all I did was put that jar in place. We'll make it more dynamic so you don't have to do an Amari server restart. But this weather view is a little more advanced. So it's a weather view. It says what parameters it needs. These are the different instances that have been created. So I can see that I've created instances for Europe and US Central and US East. So I can actually go and say, well, let's go take a look at US Central. It has already configured to say Chicago and Dallas. But you know that's all the configuration side picture from a UI side. It will serve up this UI and use the REST API to end up serving it up as well. So when I go click on this, it just went out to the internet and grabbed that weather information and put it on the page. So now I'm just showing you this as a full page. But when you start kind of stepping back and thinking about it, um, on what we want to do with the entitlements framework and the way to give out views to people, this is what we want to say. We want to see some people log in and see an operator interface, and some people log in and see different tools that are available to them. This guy gets a job browser, viewer type thing, gets a file browser, things like that. Isn't it what portals were doing for the last 20 years? And so we're taking some of those <laughs> concepts and putting them in a bar. It's totally exactly the same thing. So why not just use portal? So that's where portals kind of got a bad name when it came to the heavyweight nature of them. So we definitely <coughs> wanted to give some of the portal concepts, but tailored to this web interface and make it available here. Red Hat uh, latest one was quite lightweight. Yeah, the light right? So, yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah, so it's we It's exactly so, the same thing. From a JavaScript side, it's not exactly the same, but yeah. So we're trying to try to choose the best way to modify the Ambari web interface to let people inject stuff without us having to move over to full blown portal framework. The challenges, you know, the JavaScript world, you know, innovates at a faster rate than your model can actually innovate. I think two years down the line, you'll end up in a state where you are lagging behind, and your model is pretty rigid, and the you know the world has moved to a faster JavaScript or you know, it's just the nature. There's a lot you can do. You can do there. So you know, on, uh, as it ends up working out, like. Uh, um, when we kind of looked at portals, and we actually looked at starting with a portal framework with the Ambari web interface, and just the state of the JavaScript frameworks that we chose, you know, we kind of stepped back and said, let's custom tailor this for what we need, and only inject the portal concepts we want, versus buying into an entire framework out of the game. Because you know, what people end up putting in here will be pretty tailor fit for what they want to do with Hadoop, and we didn't need all the portal work to came along with it. At least that was our idea. No, I don't. I don't think I'm. Pushing for a portal, but I'm just saying you know, probably going to face this issue because I have seen this repeated over the years. Um, <coughs> we face that issue, like two years. Yeah, definitely, it's a slippery slope that we have to find the fine line here. So we don't want to turn into WSRP <coughs> and JSR 286 and 168. We don't want to get into that world. Um, but we have to find the fine line before we end up doing too much. You know, we knew with the bar from the web interface today it needs an entitlement framework uh, because you need to be able to go and give people controls out. Right now it's kind of coarse grain. You either have a read-only view or you have an admin view. We want to be able to target permissions so we know we need an entitlement framework under the hood. Um, and we know that we need to give a way for people to inject UI. So that's where we're heading right now. So we actually have some, some next portal people on our team too. So that we're trying to bring what was good about portals here and hopefully we find the right line between not going too far. So with these entitlements, they can live in a in Postgres or an LDAP? So right now we're thinking the Amari database is where the authorization actually gets married up, um, but we're going to have to think about how to make it more dynamic. So uh, really kind of wrapping up here, we talked about what's really new in 150. Uh, from that perspective, so maintenance mode and rolling restart, so a lot of the features I showed 
earlier, and this is the release that's in Trump that we're driving to bring to community and call for a vote in just a few weeks. And then when we start looking out, um, you know, adding the blueprints capability will come. Uh, we want to make access to all the component blocks available. We want to add Windows and Ubuntu support. We're also thinking about this entitlements framework and view support so people can customize. And then we're also thinking about better performance tuning and troubleshooting tools, as well as taking the information we have available and give people capacity planning tools. So they get an idea of how their cluster is not only operating um, at that point in time, but historically they can better you know, plan for the future and justify um, extending their cluster. Here's the uh, Amari project page. Uh, so go check it out, public JIRA, and then there's um, the project wiki that has information on how to build the product, uh, get the latest version, documentation, things like that. That's what I have. So if you were working on, if someone was working on adding in some new services to have about it now, where would you suggest to start? What the 150? The 150 could be. Yeah, is if you go with 144, you're still in kind of a, the intermediate, the, the middle ground where you still have to get public code and you have to get it bound into the agents at compile time. And with 150, you don't have to deal with that. So you can, the idea is you take a pre built Amari, which you can grab from the community or grab from wherever, and drop your stack in place and you have the best chance. So you don't have to deep the coming to the build. You said it's working on Windows and Ubuntu support, so it runs on what now? Uh, CentOS, RHEL, Oracle, Linux, less. So, um, yeah, so we actually have, we, we build the packages in the community for those as well, so it's got the RPMs across the board. So when we add Ubuntu, we'll add devs there. And for Windows, not sure what the packaging is going to be, but we'll make sure we can install a Mari server in the agents and install Windows and cluster them. Does the UI completely replace the old job track UIs do you still need those? Today you still need them because the Ambari web interface is really focused around start stop. It doesn't do a lot of like the job browser type thing you get from job tracker. And name node UI does have a basic file browser and some of the name node information. Um, over time you can see those things, you know, become part of Ambari. Um, at least right now, you still need those things. Maybe someone will make a view of what they do Ambari and see what happens. Yeah, it looks like uh, Hortonworks is uh, leading this uh, Ambari effort. Are there any company contributing back? Yep. So some of the partnerships we've had, so Microsoft and, and Teradata folks have been contributing. Red Hat's contributed a lot to the project. Uh, we've seen contributions show up a lot from other companies. Uh, someone actually dropped, they took the REST APIs and put Py Python client libraries in front of them and dropped them into the community. And then they actually wrote an Ambari shell in front of it that in the community. And I can't remember the company name that did that though. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's been activity there. So, you know, it's kind of like, even though the, the project's been around for a while, just over the past year, we've got a lot more contributors and turning people into committers. And I think that also kind of shows on how we got from incubator to the top level project. We really needed that justification to be able to get to the top level. And in terms of uh, comparison with the commercial goods, I don't think any. Uh, how uh, Ambari actually uh, looks like? Because it, uh, always they're claiming that it's behind, and uh, so so just maybe from the, from you we can uh, know better. Okay. Uh, so you know we've been moving Ambari pretty quickly. You know it's hard to compare it to a, a commercial offering, just like any open source project. Um, but yeah, we've been moving it pretty quickly and trying to identify the, the key areas that Hortonworks wants to wants to invest in in Ambari, but also enable the community to continue to add to it. So that people will kind of choose the direction it has and what features have in there. So it's kind of hard to make that comparison there, though. Are there any features in the commercial uh, uh, offerings that uh, are the new on new issues? Um, so specific question. one. Is there any specific feature uh, that uh, that is on the which is on your uh, kind of like the priority or uh, one thing? Uh, so kind of the bigger features we want to add are really just. Um, well, blueprints is the quick one that we want to do, and then the views framework. We want to get that one that one done pretty quickly over the next six months. And then we're rounding out some of the operational stuff. I think log access that I pointed out is pretty important, uh, just because it's a convenience thing for people. So as they're sitting there and troubleshooting services, they shouldn't have to go on the boxes and look at different logs themselves. 
So uh, what we are doing is just with any component that gets added to the HTTP stack, we're making sure it shows up in a bar from an operational perspective. We're still deferring their UIs to those components. Uh, but one day, they could say, I want to make a view and actually have it show up in a bar as well. You know, that might just frame some of the UI and bring it in. We're not exactly sure what's going to happen there. But we know managing Storm as a service should be available just like everything else is available once it becomes public. Uh, Hortonworks has made it available as a tech preview, and uh, you know our labs page kind of gives you an idea of when they actually plan on bringing it as part of the stack. So, uh, okay, all right, good. All right. Yeah, that's I kind of defer that to the store. Once it shows up, we'll wrap it in a bar and make it show up on the bar page. All right, thank you, speaker. Oh, so you currently support any usage statistics? So usage of the part? Yes. Uh, so right now we're not actually capturing that. So other than operational metrics, so we're capturing Hadoop operational metrics in the gang there. So all the Hadoop stuff that gets spit out, um, but not anything in detail. It's not in gang right now. You don't. That's what we don't have it. But I think it's something we do want to do more of in the future. So people can ask the question of like, who's used the most HDFS? Speaker and thank Horton Works.